Uh, yes, thank you, Terry, Louise, Julie, others, for having us here today. Uh, there's so much that we want to share. We don't have a lot of time, and we want to leave um, ample opportunity for question and discussion um, because this presentation is about partnerships between academia, with nonprofits, with local communities. And I know we all have our feet in various worlds of academia, nonprofits, and you have a lot of experience to share. Um, so we'll make sure to leave time for that. Um, I'm going to start by sharing a bit about our organization, um, a bit about how we work, uh, what we do, um, also f narrow in on our climate resilience work, um, and set the stage for what was great about this climate resilience scoping study that we re recently conducted um, with some Cornell staff and uh, a student. And then Abby is going to go into the recommendations and best practices from the scoping study and examples of some of the next steps that we're exploring. Um, great. So Episcopal Relief and Development is an international nonprofit that works in works with partners in over 30 countries in the world. We're not an implementing organization. Our mandate is to really build the organizational capacity of local organizations and to support them financially and with tech, uh, sector expertise for community development programming. So in other words, we don't have offices um, in, in countries in which we work. Uh, we're working to build the capacity of local organizations to do the work. And these are the develop, mostly the development arms of the Anglican and Episcopal churches, um, where, and they often operate in the most remote of areas where there aren't a lot of government or other nonprofit um, agencies. Um, they've been there forever and will be there forever, even after um, their funding may or may not leave. And so that's a big part of our mission and our mandate is to build local capacity. Um, and the map here, the, the green highlights where we're really focusing on our climate resilience work. But overall, Episcopal Relief and Development has three uh, strategic frameworks that we work under. Uh, the first being women and women's empowerment and the fight against global, um, sorry, gender-based violence. The second, um, helping communities um, adapt to climate change, and the third, um, early childhood development. And so our partnership uh, with Cornell and a lot of the research that we've done has been focused on our food security work. And historically, our food security work has, with been, has been with smallholder farmers, uh, really focusing on how to increase crop production on very marginal land. Um, with with some success, uh, I'd say limited success, and we've been looking at how communities can really adapt in the face of climate change. A lot of the um, the countries in which we work, semi-arid climates, uh, rainfall is becoming more and more um, variable. Um, plan knowing when to plant um, is it's it's a toss-up. Just in Tanzania this year. Rains came a month late. Um, it's, people have to plant three or four times. Um, it's become very difficult. So we know we can't operate as business as usual. We have to really look at the, the situation from a systems lens. And in our, in our climate resilience uh, strategy, we're looking at WASH, economic de development, environment, disaster management, and really this focus on livelihoods because of a lot of the farmers we work with on land so small and depleted that they can't provide for their household consumption. They need some other income. And so this scoping study that we've done with um, Cornell has really helped us look at what are communities doing to adapt? What can they do differently? Um, what are other options for building resilience to climate change? This is a picture of the, the publication on the right. Um, and briefly, just how we're looking at our climate resilience work, this idea of years of trying to cope and bounce back after shocks um, is only can work to a certain degree, right? With this new normal um, and then the mitigation strategies and now really looking thoughtfully at adaptations. And so Episcopal Relief and Development, when we 
think about our work with our local partners and we think about our work with academic research partners, we think that there are four key principles. Um, the first being about partnership and how it really needs to be collaborative and how it takes time, um, resources, and a lot of thought to build meaningful <coughs> partnerships that are based on mutual understanding, ec managing expectations, and building each other's leadership and capacity for um, collaborative knowledge building. And in these pictures, um, you might recognize Terry um, and uh, Professor Peter Hobbs. This idea that um, when we're working with our local partners, we want them to be, we see our role uh, at ERD as a bridge between, say, academic research partners and our, the local communities and the local partners. How to put them in a position of, of leadership and where it's give and take. They're learning from researchers, but also sharing what they, what they know and are proud of and experts in. This idea of a focus on process, that research, while we, there are results we need to gain, and um, we really want it to be an empowering and not an extractive process, um, especially for the communities in which we work. And during the scoping study, um, it was mixed methods, all qualitative, but we really tried to make it so that there was a focus on participatory learning and action. Having communities give their voice to the situation, to what they've experienced, uh, what has worked, how things have changed over the years in terms of climate and agriculture. On the right, you'll see a picture of um, a historical timeline activity. I know some of you are taking a participatory research methodology course and are maybe familiar with the different ways of engaging communities. Um, and the way in which you do that can be very empowering. Even if the information you thought you were going in to get, you don't get, just the process of having people, and with PLA, it's, it's powerful because you, you really want to get the voices of the voiceless, the elderly, the women, the young girls, hearing their experiences, and having them be seen by their fellow community members, sharing. Um, and it can build social cohesion, solidarity. So that's one aim of, of the way we work with communities, is to build solidarity through the process. Um, so not just about the results. Although from these activities, whether it's historical timeline, community mapping, um, what are some of the other PLA tools we use? Pairwise ranking, transect walks, I'm sure you've heard of these. Um, we get very valuable information. Uh, the picture on the left was uh, during the scoping study, uh, the community wanted to do sort of a, a skit, a drama about the situation um, before being involved with um, the program training and then after um, sort of to give voice of their experience and how they've benefited. This, I mean, this is related to the previous two, but this idea of, of learning and collaborative learning where we each have knowledge to offer and receive. Um, the picture on the left is when, I'm sorry, on the right is when we're in the field and hearing from, from women um, who have farmed the same land for many years and the, the strategies they've used to be resilient in the face of climate change and exchanging ideas. Um, yeah. And lastly, this idea of a focus on people and not being um, problem-centered, focusing on a problem to be solved, but really thinking about relationships and, and people and how that can be just as important as the results of a research. It's the, res the relationships that you build and putting a face um, to the problems that we see, whether it's, it's drought or food insecurity and how important that is in, in developing strategies for resilience. And just to add, the picture on the right is of, of Crystal, the student who um, helped with the scoping study, and just the important role students play, and not just what they contribute to their research and their unique, fresh insights that people who've been in the field for a while sort of lose that, that fresh lens. So her insights were so invaluable. Um, but just her, her enthusiasm, her ideas, and what that brings to the table whether it's with our local partners or the communities um, and its relationships that are formed and can last lifetimes. And related to these 
those four things that I just shared, I wanted to share um, a part of Episcopal Relief and Development's theory of change. And this accompanies our various sector logical frameworks, but we always want to remind ourselves of how, um, how we want to work with people and how behavior change occurs. So you notice it's, it's similar to the socio-ecological model for behavior change and the importance of focusing on individuals, interpersonal relationships, collective, and then institutional change. And so in everything that we do, whether program implementation or research, we're really focusing on people's dignity as individuals and the trust that's needed between people within communities, the love that can come from that, um, and at the end, the hope that's needed um, in these, these very vulnerable communities, but places that are really so full of assets and strengths. And um, before I, we run out of time, let me move on to Abby's piece. Sorry, this slide was just sort of a, a reiteration a little bit of the, the key learnings, um, the importance of investing in relationship building with research and academic partners, <clears throat> um, just being aware of our shared and divergent interests, skills, and priorities. Always questioning your expertise, your own and others, and listen more than speak. This idea of, again, focusing on process and not just results. And always supporting local partner and community members, their lead and active role in, in the process. So Abby is going to go and talk a bit about the recommendations and next steps. Yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah, so where are my glasses? So yeah, so the scoping study came can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So the scoping study came with a list of a long list of well, a good bunch of recommendations, but for reason of time I'm just going to limit myself to you know, some key recommendations. So we can categorize them as, you know, recommendations related to the culture of learning, technical re recommendations, and context. And another big takeaway or recommendation is contextual strategizing. So I'll go into these one by one, uh, well, some of them time allowing. And I'll also zero in on the water management, watershed management, where we did a case study right after the scoping study. So basically, it's in response or addressing the key recommendations of the scoping study. So that would be presented in a kind of a short case study. So one of the recommendations was strengthening the community of practice. So we classify the you know, a community of practice at partner level, organizational level, and at community level. What we mean by partner to partner level is, as you, I think uh, Vanessa mentioned it, this coping study, for example, was done in Tanzania, in a semi-arid zone, and in Zimbabwe. So we have two partners here. So just like what we normally do with partners with uh, you know, having same objectives, and seeking the same outcomes, we try to really strengthen the partner-to-partner -partner relationship so that they can learn on the various approaches, constraints they have, you know, and address you know, things that they need to resolve jointly. And then at organizational level, I think it's, it's a bit more broader because we're thinking about organizations like for international research, organizations or local NGOs, but then why do we have to duplicate, you know, efforts that have been proven already? So it's like looking out, I mean, nobody, I mean, we have a partner, for example, in Zimbabwe, but then can they really address the whole set of complex problems related to food systems and food security? I don't think so. So it's looking out, you know, and reaching out and linking up with other networks and organizations that seek the same outcomes like that. And at community level, it's the farmer peer networks that we try to 
you know, strengthened, you know, some could be more developed in terms of cooperative development where others are still learning. So it's more to know about that peer network, developing it, you know, cultivating it. And then one big learning, of course, I think for everyone, is that farmers learn better when they talk to each other rather than the formal approach. Yes, I mean, training really works, but then farmers really can ask surprising questions when you leave them alone. <laughs> they said, you know, uh, a person can come from one village and another one can come from another village. But then, like what we heard, you know, does this bug or pest, you know, really create a problem in your village? Would be the question they might ask. You know, so, but outsiders may ask different questions which are totally, might not be related you know, to the issue. So we try to encourage a farmer to farmer learning approach. So when it comes to farmer training, I think we are, I mean, the organization in Tanzania is, is in Zimbabwe, especially is doing based, is doing well in a, in a center-based approach where, for example, farmers go or are enrolled in a learning center for around two years, where they spend like half a day there doing horticulture management, but at the same time having their own plot. So once they, whatever harvest they get from the plot, it goes to them as individuals and as a group. But the whole idea being raking in as, as much income as possible so that after two years, when they go out, they already have the assets and the resources and the knowledge and skills to set up their own you know, horticulture schemes or whatever. Of course, this looks smooth, but then you know, the downside of it is, did we really think about the value addition? Did we really think about you know, seed and forage system? Or livestock? can we integrate livestock management in the, in the training curriculum or business management? So we're thinking more systematically and more with more inclusiveness, you know, in the knowledge and skills that they can manage to take in over the two-year grad, you know, period. So it's more to do about the classroom, the practical, and the income generation approach, all combined in three. So the whole incentive being, if they have a plot of their own, they're of course, you know, incentivized by the harvest they get, which they can either use, consume, or sell on. So this approach is gaining traction, so that's where the partner-to-partner -partner comes in. So maybe the partner in Zimbabwe who's doing this can really share it with the partner in Tanzania. So these are, you know, some smaller examples. And then, well, we call, uh, there is a need to create really an innovation platform, that's what we call it, because some things are quite new for us you know, and not tested. So one of the key areas, as I said, is watershed management. Uh, obviously, you don't start a huge scheme, but you pilot a scheme and then learn as you go. So that's one innovation. And, you know, the learning center approach, which I explained to you, integrating livestock and seed management, livestock marketing, value addition, and of course, ultimately, you know, cooperative development are the key areas where we want to encourage it you know, innovations and learning. And then, as I said before, it's linking our partners and even ourselves with ICRISAT, for example, which has a lot of, you know, organizational presence in sub-Saharan Africa, or some best practices in goat marketing schemes in Zimbabwe where ICRISAT is heavily involved. Private partner partnership private NGO partnership could also be into this situation. Or even appropriate technology like tillage technology, rippers and everything. There are some specialized organizations that the partner can be networked with. And of course, like what I mentioned here, it's the partner peer exchanges, but then not peer exchanges for the sake of peers going there and, you know, going back home, it's more to do about having a clear checklist of what they want to learn. And we should not set the agenda, but they should set the agenda of what they want to learn. And then go back, internalize and practice it. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is a kind of a challenging area for, for I think, for any NGO or implementing 
uh, or any other implementer, it's contextual strategizing. We, I think all of us would understand that there is no homogeneity between two communities. You have village A and you have village B. But then there is this uh, notion that one side, one, uh, one thing fits all, one size fits all. So whatever agri-package or natural resource conservation or climate resiliency scheme we introduce, you know, it has to be looked from a contextual perspective because there is still heterogeneity between village A and village B. So there's no such thing as one, one size fits. So even soil conditions from one village to another could be different. Uh, water accessibility could be different from one place to another. And even the uh, power dynamics could be different, even though they are within one ethnic group or culture, but then elites could have could be either enablers or disablers of one uh, of many things. So it's looking at the differences in assets, the gaps in the community dynamics that could differ from one village community to another, even if they are 10 kilometers apart. So another Another question that we're grappling with and we're trying to address is, you know, who are we lifting up? You know, sometimes, you know, the approach is to, you know, have the contact farmer with, uh, with the expectation that, you know, a lot of inputs and whatever training we give is with the contact farmer and then early adapters will come in following suit, you know and then this thing goes to scale. But it could work or it couldn't work because in the first place, contact farmers are maybe middle class farmers and they are, they are willing to take the risks and that's why they're successful. So are, we lifting, so are we lifting the vulnerable farmers? Are they replicating the practices that the contact farmers are doing? Maybe so or maybe not, or maybe not in the pace or magnitude that, you, that we want it to be. So these are the key questions that we grapple with. And of course, like any other implementing organization, it's the issue of partner uh, targeting. Who are we par targeting? Are we targeting the vulnerable farmers? And if so, what tools and guidance do we have? So these are clearly some of the things that the scoping study works. So now, uh, let me go to the, maybe this would interest you. So we had, so that's again in response to the watershed recommendation, which really comes out big in the scoping study. So then we decided, okay, why don't we go to the community? Uh, let, let's go to the community and talk with them because in the end, they have to own it. It's not us owning it, but they have to own it, but then, there is also a challenge here in Zimbabwe because if we want to talk about watershed management, do people really have an understanding of watershed management or do they even practice irrigation for that matter? So it was a kind of, so one way of doing it was using those PLA tools. So mostly what we did is we did a focus group discussion like with 30 to 40 farmers Obviously, as you see, we're using a historical timeline. So we, it's a mixed age, gender, you know, women, men, older people, of course, older farmers who know the history of that area. So then they, we said, give us a pond. And then they gave us Lutshini pond. Let's talk about this pond and that, nothing else. So what happened next? So they decided to go down to 1937. Obviously, 1937, you know, you won't find a person like 100 years old to remember this. So basically, this is kind of oral history. So there were some gentlemen in the 80s or late 70s that could testify to that. So in 1937, this pond, as you can see, is full. And it's vibrant. You have a lot of, you know, I'm not a naturalist or an agronomist, but I can at least record what they're saying. So there was a lot of fishery happening in this pond in 1937. There was a lot of livestock and it was only serving to village communities. Grazing was abundant. But then come 1947, similar situation. And if you go to 1964, 
you know, some fish resources were dwindling, there's, but, and then there was less density, and, you know, they had this, what do you call it, hardwood, hardwood tree? Yeah. So th that, that tree came up every time they, you know, they, they were actually nostalgic, you know, of how things were there back in the 60s. And then come 19, 1980, that was the devastating time, you know, 1982, because there was a big drought in Zimbabwe. So that's when they really experienced, you know, water levels going down, livestock were dying, disease. And now, look, they don't have two villages anymore. So three villages now. So there is a lot of, you know, population density also happening. So I'm just going, I'm trying to go very quickly. So in 19, I think, yeah, 1992, no water, everything died, dried out, loss of livestock. And I think but, uh, they lost all the grass vegetation. They named the species even, and the trees and everything they lost. And then in 1990, uh, What's, what's interesting here is in 1982, they started doing some irrigation, even, that, even though the water is small. This may be anecdotal, it has to be triangulated with the evidence we can have to collect, but for me, to my understanding, that's when they really started irrigation in that area. They never knew about irrigation before that, although I'm not being conclusive. So come 1992, no water, everything died out, loss of livestock, 2008 to date. So what we have is a lot of gullies. The rills are there. You can see them. But a lot of scent, you know, rainwater follow going into gullies. It's, I'll show you the picture. So it's dry. So next slide. So let's say then we said, let's go. Let's go to that place. Let's do a transect walk. I'm sure you Use this tool before in your participatory research work, maybe. But the transect walk really works on, you know, uh, understanding soil systems, livelihood system, natural resources. But we used it differently. You know, the beauty of, you know, these participatory exercises is you can use the tool in every way you want. So basically, as you can see, uh, just there is a lot of, you know, there are some villages, we see some kind of vegetation. I don't want to go through it in detail because for lack of time. And then we also see the slope and elevation of the, you know, if you look at the first column. And then there is no settlement, sparse trees, no shrubs. You know, it's a gentle slope. We see one or two hardwood trees <laughs> remaining from 1937. And whenever the situation changes, we draw a column and then we see that the land flats out, reels become wider, occasional hardwood tree, shrubs, and then what's indicative of a pond being there, I'm not a scientist on this, but we see a lot of alluvial soil on that flat, flat surface. And then just behind it, we, we saw the gullies and the, you know, and the, you know, the gullies and everything else that happens when water you know, flows everywhere. So after having this uh, discussion, uh, the key question was, how can we reverse the situation? So how can we bring back the pond? What was the third question. Now they've, they've gone through the history of the pond, transit thoughts. So they came up with uh, a few exciting, you know, uh, steps like we're going to do distant, you know, distant. We're going to use, you know, mechanical or labor during the dry spells. We're going to mobilize people. Actually, the youth could be involved here, and then they also want some technical help in us, you know, in, in, in terms of hydro, hydrogeological surveys, topography, contour, landscaping, and of course, they also talked about resolving the land issue, you know, because around that pond is the grazing area. So who owns it? Who, who is the elite who really influences that this land should be allotted for whatever purpose they want to use it? So all these things really need to be addressed. 
But what is important for me in this exercise is at least, and if uh, I think it may be in full, they now understand what we're talking and what we're thinking about and what they also are thinking about. So they also came up with different exercises on envisioning what what that this place would look like. So it's like if we descend the alluvial soil, then we'll have the earth mound, then we'll plant vetivar grass, you know, which will hold on and or sisal on the mound, you know. And then the alluvial soil could be used for horticulture, we could use but it went on and on and on. But for me what we created was excitement, curiosity and some resort to get this thing, you know, further from our own side, of course, we can provide the technical support and accompaniment. But what we know is that we have to start slow, pilot it, learn, accompany, and move along. Escape. Yeah. So, yeah. You have any questions? Or we anything? could say a lot more, but we yeah. want to open it up for questions and discussion. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we partner with the, as I was saying before, the development arms of the Episcopal and Anglican churches around the world. Episcopal Relief and Development, we are affiliated with the Episcopal Church. We receive funding for them, but we are a separate NGO. So um, the staff who we work with can be non-Christian, Christian, Muslim. We work with all people, but the local partners that we work with are affiliated with the church system. Uh, they, the staff, like I said, the staff there could be Christian or not. The communities they work with are often not Christian. Uh, the Anglican the Episcopal Church is quite small in the scheme of religions around the world. So um, the communities are often other other religions. So it's it's a structure that works well because there are churches throughout Africa, Southeast Asia, Central America where we work. Um, and as I said before, they're in the most remote places and they've been there a while and they have a desire to to uh, improve the lives of their of their families because they live in these communities. So working through those institutions um, and building their capacity, we have found has been um, a really good methodology. But we, we do like to really stress that although we are affiliated with churches, uh, we work with all people. And many of the staff ourselves are, are not are not Christian. Yes. The um, timeline that you had produced with the farmers, Abby, did you get a chance to discuss with them what happened in between 1937 and 1945, and between 1945 and 1960? What mm -hmm. what were some of the pressures that mm -hmm. you like? Who were the actors that removed the grasses, or mm -hmm. what was the cause that led to the yep. hardwood tree yeah. dying? Were you able to jump into some of those? What were the pressures that caused the yeah. reduction of vegetation? Yeah, yeah. So basically, they are cognizant of you know nowadays you know everyone speaks the climate change narrative. <laughs> they they really relate it or link it to that. That's one. Number two, it's about the population density that came from year to year. But the biggest turning point was the prolonged drought in 1982. So that's key. And then, of course, you know, once they had the drought, they never came back, you know, and decentered that thing. Because 1982, Zimbabwe was going on, undergoing a lot of turbulence, you know. The economy was going down, people were dying left and right. So there really wasn't a chance to prioritize things and decent upon like that, yeah. Yes? Um, so going back to the part about um, contextual strategies, so when you're working with the most disenfranchised subsistence farmers and they have very, very limited access to infrastructure and market access, how do you convince them that there's actually a market for um, value addition? And how do you implement those systems? Yeah. 
Um, it's difficult because in many of the places we work, there really aren't many markets. And so some of what we're, we've are exploring with the recommendations from the scoping study is how to work with organizations such as ICRSAT or um, the local Commerce Bureau to help create opportunities for markets. Some of these communities where we work are really off the beaten path. So it's even, even if they do have um, a bountiful harvest and have surplus to sell, how do they get it somewhere to make a profit? Um, in Zimbabwe, the, the value addition efforts have been pretty successful. Do you want to talk about that and the partnership with the yeah. tomato sauce? And Yeah, in Zimbabwe, you know, they, they're doing a lot of value addition. The trainees themselves, you know, they do the jams, they do the tomatoes, and then the Kali, I don't know, they have a very good way of conserving it, drying it, or and then defrosting it later. No, humidifying it, and then it's edible. Yeah. I said defrosting, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so the next level is where are we going to take it? Because obviously, these people are going to graduate, they're going to go back, and then they're going to harvest more. So that's where we really have to think about, yes, this value addition thing which they did in, in a contained learning environment works. So how is it going to go to scale when they go out in their respective villages? And what happens when you have a lot of tomatoes being produced? So that's where the marketing aspect and longer term sustainability of maybe marketing cooperatives could come in. We don't know. But that's a key research question. Let me, one, one comment, too. Uh, both have mentioned ICRASAT. Well, you know, we think of ICRASAT as more, you know, working on on breeding of pulses and millets and sorghum and, and water management in semi-arid areas. But they also have a small cadre of people who, are, who had been in, in that location for some time and said, you know, they're just huge barriers uh, that we can't, you know, we can't fully address just through genetic improvement and, and through water management. and, and uh, as they looked around, one of the things that made households really vulnerable to food insecurity during these drought times was that one of the only tangible assets that they had was their, their goats, these smallholders. And that when those uh, droughts would come along, everybody would have to sell them. The price was exceedingly low. And so these people who are agronomists and water resource people at ICRASAT said, look, we need to convene some sort of an innovation platform, bring in the private sector, bring in the uh, you know, local government, regional government, and, and, and come up with some ways to uh, enhance market options for these, these small farmers. And that's going to have more impact, perhaps, than some of the work we've been doing for the last decade uh, in genetic and genetic improvement so on. I mean they're continuing that work obviously but uh, so some of these organizations are doing work that's a little bit beyond what we think of as their customary mandate because the challenges are so great and they're taking much more of a systems approach much more of an innovation systems approach bringing a lot of organizations to work together sort of relates to the to the topic of partnerships and uh, in working in less siloed ways. So that's just an example. Thank you. Mr. Greer? I was uh, wondering if you knew uh, about the historic um, land management in this region. So currently you're mentioning that people are farming on small plots of land, but is this region sort of ecologically only, um, can only be successful if you have more of a communal approach to land management? So you're, you're saying that they're recognizing they need watershed scale management. Uh, most likely to have a pond in that dry landscape, you know, you're going to have to manage your water resources um, in sync with each other. And so do you know if that region actually historically had villages that didn't have a concept of, you know, land, owning your land, your small land parcel, but rather, you know, they were, there was active, um, you know, collaborative management of the landscape so that everyone could have livestock survive um, and more of a cooperative approach to you know, if in one year someone's successful, but there's, there's sort of like a shared risk management um, to deal with um, a landscape that's inherently much drier than uh, where we are today. Mm -hmm. uh, like in Ithaca, we don't have to worry about water here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Zimbabwe, 
I couldn't speak to that. Um, in Tanzania, from my understanding and the discussions we've had with farmers and the partner there, people have pretty much, you know, worked with their neighbors, but and and have you know bartered and traded crops for livestock and have worked together in that way, but the sort of conceptual looking at their landscapes and how they use the land in relation to one another and the water sources. I don't know if that's happening to that degree. Terry, do you recall? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's an important question and something we need to, to think about. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Yes? Uh, this is more of a question. Does ERD pool uh, scientific resources from other NGOs? Do you have your own scientists? I'm unfamiliar with that organization. Yeah. So uh, we don't have any scientists on staff. Um, most of our backgrounds as program officers are uh, multi-sector. Um, so a lot of our information comes from our research partnerships, whether it's Cornell, Notre Dame, other universities that we partner with. Uh, we do attend conferences and keep abreast of the, the latest research. Um, and we do that in collaboration with our partners. We attend conferences with our local uh, partner organizations. A um, big part of our work as program officers is reading up on these things, be, um, becoming experts in our own ways, and uh, always confiding in or getting additional help from actual experts in the field. Um, yeah, so definitely in the field, the local uh, research institutions, the local government extension agents, we regularly meet with them and talk about our program strategies, how it aligns with government policies and practices. Um, and the latest science. Did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. One, also, one of the program thrusts over the last several mm -hmm. years has been uh, moving farmers from maize, which is a, quite a risky crop, uh, even yeah. though it's uh, an important crop in terms of uh, uh, food traditions. Uh, but it's very risky in a very dry area like this, an area that's becoming drier. So. Uh, working with ICRASAT a lot on uh, 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 everything from different types of beans to millets and sorghum and, and uh, so many of the uh, some of the research partnerships and the ideas uh, are coming out of that association with, with uh, ICRASAT. Yeah. That that gets me to a question that's been perplexing me here, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And that is, did you discuss in this transit block the cropping systems that we use? I don't see agricultural cropping systems or any land use, but that doesn't quite get there. And so, obviously, the type of agriculture that's practiced here is going to be important. But maybe it was just so uniform; it wasn't even worth differentiating on your transit block. Just why isn't agriculture? Yeah, because there wasn't any. There wasn't any agriculture. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, because what we saw is just that homestead, you know, kind of contained thing. And when we asked the questions, you know, it it's maybe it's because of the seasonal time we came, we did this transact work, but you know, there wasn't anything. So they're not growing crops there at all. In this particular area, in this particular. So this area, whenever it rains. If something grows, they use it as communal grazing. Yeah. So that's why there is another challenge here because after so many years, the soil has already compacted. The whatever, you know, they have, they use whatever used to be the pond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the rails, you can see them from all time. You know how. how I know what's. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I would think that if your main emphasis is on livelihood security, yeah. food security, those kinds of things, that you might want to look beyond the pond yeah. itself. When I first saw the word pond, I thought you were talking about the pond as a focal point, yeah. but that you were probably looking at the landscape in which crops were grown. Any crops. I, so is the, I would want to know what is their main means of livelihood security to help evaluate whether, how important this pond is to that. Did you look at that at all? Mm, well, that's a good question. In your discussions? So basically this, uh, this transect walk yeah. was 
them trying to demonstrate where it where it is where it used to be a problem situation that yeah. they wanted you to help solve yeah yeah yeah, uh -huh. yeah but i uh, i get your point that mm -hmm. that would be a more to help evaluate yeah. the potential for, for yeah getting that time if at all i mean yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, and... Uh...